Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Hey, before we get into it, a couple of things. Uh, number one, uh, I want to talk about uh, Bulwark Plus again. If you have signed up for Bulwark Plus, if you are one of our members, uh, make sure you check out our live stream. This will be our year-end holiday live stream, the entire team, and we're going to basically say goodbye to 2020. So this is, uh, it, it is tonight, it is, and we'll send you the information if you're signed up for Bulwark Plus. Uh, it is at eight o'clock uh, Eastern time and it is seven o'clock Central time. So I really appreciate it. Also, uh, in my newsletter this morning, we made it available to everyone. And I'm playing around with the idea that that maybe we can quit Trump at some point. I think the default setting is that Trump will, you know, retain his death grip on the Republican Party and will haunt our dreams for years. But maybe we're underestimating the rather dramatic gap between being president and being not president. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm I'm right about all of this, but this is something that we will debate, including maybe we'll discuss it with our guest today, uh, the chief political uh, correspondent for Politico magazine, Tim Alberta. Good morning, Tim. Thanks for joining us. Charlie, pleasure to be with you as always. Well, just a couple of things, Tim, first of all, before before we get into all the other stuff. So there's this big controversy now about the new incoming deputy White House chief of staff uh, calling, you know, saying that, you know, yes, of course, we can deal with Republicans, even though they're fuckers. And, and Mitch McConnell is is a really horrible person. And, and, there's, and, there's, and there's a lot of there's a lot of pearl clutching about this, isn't there? But here's here's my here's what I'm slightly obsessed about. And maybe you can help me with this, Tim. This is literally, well, not quite literally, but it's pretty much the plot of the first episode of West Wing, season one, <laughs> episode one, right? Where Josh Lyman is the deputy White House chief of staff, and he says something impolitic about a Christian evangelical leader. And so the, the whole first episode is, will Josh Lyman get fired for saying something distasteful about somebody? And so here we are. All these years later, and we have the deputy chief of staff saying something distasteful about somebody on the right. And it's like, it's like, is this like the like the new iteration of the West Wing? What a nice poll that was. I, I you know, as soon as you said it, I, I remember back to it. But boy, it hadn't occurred to me until then. So kudos to you for the for, for making the pop culture connection. Um, you know, the, the thing is about uh, what she said, Charlie, I don't know, like I'm. I, I sort of uh, I view this as one of those moments where two things can be true at the same time. Like, uh, yes, there is a lot of pearl clutching and any Republican who is pretending to be, uh, you know, offended and and uh, sort of disgusted and and uh, alienated by this kind of talk is completely full of it. And we know that. Right. They, they've obviously dealt with much worse, uh, not just over the last four years, but in their careers. I mean, this is politics, right? So that that is true. I think on the other side of it, um, look, you don't want to uh, get out in front of your boss. You don't want to uh, step on your boss's message. And that's what she did. Like, you know, when your boss is the <laughs> president-elect and he has built his entire campaign message around this idea of lowering the temperature uh, and 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 bringing down the volume and uh, hopefully restoring some functionality uh, and, and maybe even some some goodwill to Washington. Uh, and 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 by the way, I think Biden is genuine in in wanting those things. I mean, that's who the guy is. He's an institutionalist. He's friends with a lot of these guys. He and Mitch McConnell are actually friends, like not Washington friends. They're friends. So like, I think that those things are real for Biden. And so. To have your deputy chief of staff who manage your campaign come out, uh, you know, a month before the inauguration and call the other side a bunch of fuckers, like, it's just, you know, like, is, is it the end of the world? Of course not. And, and is there a lot of pearl clutching? Yes. But it's not helpful for obvious reasons. It just, it gives, if, if for no other reason... It just gives some of these Republicans who want any excuse they can find to to sort of tell people that Biden doesn't mean business, that Biden doesn't want to work with them, that that it's all that it's all been a charade, and and that uh, and that Biden is just sort of has talked this good game, but he's going to be a fierce partisan. Uh, it just gives them ammunition for, for to, to 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 advance that argument. So I think in that respect, it's it's just not helpful. OK, so I want to I want to get to uh, your piece that you wrote, uh, the 20 people, tw tw 20 voters who determined 2020. Uh, but, but let's just talk about the news of the day right now, where, where we're at here, because it is interesting that it looks like they're getting closer to a 
stimulus slash relief piece of legislation, um, which of course had been blocked by Mitch McConnell for a very, very long time. I, how should we read the fact that they're doing this now rather than before the election? I mean, there are a lot of people who think, and I, I guess I'm one of them, who would think that this was a tremendous lost opportunity for the Republicans for Donald Trump not to pass this legislation before the election so that he could send out a lot of money. So I, I, guess, I guess the reason I'm asking this is it kind of feels like McConnell is moving on from Trump in a couple of ways. Number one, he said, OK, the election's over. Biden is the president. Uh, number two, we're uh, going to go ahead with this uh, this relief bill without uh, w- without the president. And obviously, there's still that national defense bill hanging out there that they passed overwhelmingly uh, despite uh, Trump's veto threat. So give me your sense of the sort of the lay of the land, because I, I know we're, we're all sort of locked into the, the past narratives. But M- McConnell is moving on, isn't he? Yeah, well, so a few things, <clears throat> Charlie. I, I would say first, um, I think the pre-election failure to get a relief bill passed actually had more to do with Pelosi than McConnell. And uh, and and uh, there are Democrats who will tell you privately that they believe that Pelosi's motives there were were purely political. That that she believed, and 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 by the way, uh, probably rightly so believed that another big round of, of, of stimulus money going out, checks signed by Donald J. Trump right before the election, uh, could have been a significant political boon to his campaign. And uh, that was, that f- from, from a lot of conversations I've had with a lot of Democrats in the last two months about this, uh, there's, a, there's a, a pretty widespread, uh, widely held belief that, that Pelosi uh, did not want to allow that to happen. Now, uh, obviously, uh, with the margins now being as close as they were, and with some, uh, I think Jamel Bowie in the New York Times made this argument. I've seen some other people make it in a pretty compelling way also. You know, there's there's some reason to believe that Trump's uh, inroads that he made with some working class minority voters was due in no small part to those relief checks, Right. Mm-hmm. And and so if you believe that, uh, then you look at that decision made by Pelosi, not only to reject negotiations uh, with with uh, Mnuchin, uh, but also to basically give the middle finger to this bipartisan uh, problem solvers compromise legislation that was introduced late in the summer. If you recall that situation where uh, Pelosi went on the Wolf Blitzer show on CNN and basically tore Wolf Blitzer a new one because he dared to ask like, hey, a bunch of your moderate Democrats in the House have have thrown their support behind this compromise bill that they worked really hard to craft. And you're basically just like laughing it off. And uh, and she got very worked up about it. But like there were a lot of Democrats really pissed off with Pelosi at that point because they felt like she was playing politics. Now, again, hindsight, hindsight being 2020, a lot of those same Democrats will tell you now, holy, holy moly, maybe maybe Pelosi. Uh, you know, save the presidency for Biden, right? It, no, nobody can know. But so to fast forward, I think yeah. it, it, it makes sense that now that the election's behind us, that that uh, the two sides are both willing to come together and try and get this thing done uh, in a way that they that that they didn't have that sort of um, similar buy-in, you know, six weeks ago. Um, but as far as McConnell himself and his willingness to move on from Trump. Yeah, I think McConnell had to play out the string here, right? He wasn't he wasn't willing to get ahead of this at any point. Uh, obviously, once the Electoral College meets and votes and makes formal the decision uh, to to elect Joe Biden, then he's willing to go on the Senate floor and and congratulate him and and have a private conversation with him and talk about getting down to business. But I think anything uh, earlier than that would have been viewed as a sort of provocation in the eyes of Trump and in the eyes of the White House. And McConnell, listen, the guy, he knows how to play Trump. He knows he, he knows the guy well enough. Uh, he sort of knows which buttons to push and when. And so obviously, he dragged his feet and, and I think sort of embarrassed himself by waiting as long as he did. But he felt that that was obviously in his own best interest. 
Okay, so the the other thing that he's doing is he's telling and he, he's he's telling Republicans not to raise objections on January sixth to the to the election. Uh, and it only takes one senator to force a floor vote. Now, obviously, there's going to be a whole bunch of congressmen who are going to do it, but he's saying don't do it because this would be a terrible roll call. I I find this fascinating because of course he can't stop someone from doing it. What is your gut sense? Is is is, is he going to succeed, um, or is somebody like um, a Ted Cruz or a Rand Paul going to stand up on January sixth and force a a roll call vote on this? My gut sense is that the opportunity there is is too good. I think so. For for one of these people to pass up and. And that if one of them is willing to uh, to seize that moment, then, you know, let's say Cruz wants to seize it or let's say Cotton wants to seize it or Howley or Rand or, you know, one of these guys who's got an eye on 2024 and who, who realizes that this is going to and, you know, earn them endless play on Fox and and, um, you know, celebrity and, and uh, adoration on the right. then. I think if one of them takes that leap, the others are only inches behind them and jumping in as well. So you could see a kind of a fascinating domino effect. But I'd be stunned, Charlie, honestly, if, if they all fell in line behind McConnell. McConnell's very good at keeping his his troops in line. He's very good at, at preventing defections. Uh, but this is so nakedly political and it's such red meat to the conservative base and to the, the, the MAGA universe that it's just going to be, uh, it's just a hanging curveball at like 65 over the heart of the plate. There's no way you're going to tell these guys to not swing at it. Okay, I just want to go on record as saying I completely agree with you. And I was I was sort of like going through the list of people who would, who would you know, stand down on all of this. And I finally you get to somebody like a Josh Hawley. Look, this is the ultimate MAGA branding move, right? Yeah. This is the to be the one guy that said this. And, and and you're absolutely right. The moment he stands up and says, realizes, look, this is going to, I'm going to dominate right wing media. I'm going to be the guy that's going to go into, um, you know, New Hampshire and say, who stood with the president when they were stealing the election? I was the only one that did that. I mean, you remember how, uh, uh, you know, Ted Cruz, managed to turn that that stupid um, feudal filibuster a few years ago into a plausible presidential campaign. And you know that's going to happen. So Josh Hawley has this moment for the MAGA branding. And and at that moment, then all these other guys are going to stand up and say, me too. Yep. I mean, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that anybody, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that McConnell is going to put a great deal of pressure on them. But as you point out, I mean, there's there's a limitation here. I mean, this is this is the opportunity. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity for a lot of these guys. Um, well, we, and, we, and look, uh, you know, the U.S. Senate is, is obviously the center stage in, in American politics and in global politics. But the truth of the matter is, Charlie, we both know that, uh, you know, on your average Tuesday afternoon, uh, there aren't that many people uh, tuned in watching C-SPAN, uh, checking out what's happening on the House, uh, on the on the Senate floor or on the House floor for that matter. Uh, but you better believe that uh, come January 6th, there are going to be millions and millions and millions of people watching what's happening live inside the Senate chamber. And so, yeah, that, to, to your point, this is, I mean, Look, th- these guys get up in the middle of an empty chamber at 11 o'clock at night with one camera rolling and they'll put on a dramatic production, believing that, it, uh, you know, that it, that it has the potential to sort of change the arc of their careers and, and nobody watches it. Right. When they get up there knowing that the entire world is tuned in watching them and 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 held in suspense, wondering who's going to make a move and. Uh, and and what the implications are and who's going to follow like it's just again these people are it, it's not just that they are sort of craven political creatures a lot of them are amateur thespians and this is like their this is their moment right this is a packed house on opening night with the you know the the reviewers in the audience and the potential to make a career for themselves and and I'm sorry but that's just too good to pass up it is too good to pass up. Okay, so I want to talk about um, the the way you closed out the campaign because you know one day and I was feeling in a pretty good mood. I I, I turn on cable television and um, 
and there you are. And um, everybody else is kind of doing rah rah, you know, America, you know, strong America with all of its sacred bonds, all the the institutions of democracy have come through. And and then there's Tim Alberta, who's saying, no, actually, I think I wrote this down. America is in a very dark place right now. And I haven't seen anything to suggest the dawn is approaching. So I have to say, I, I've I, I've read your stuff for years and years and years. I've never heard this tone from your reporting before. So before we get, I mean, this this campaign has shaken a lot of people, and I think it continues to. So am I right about this? Yeah, well, Charlie. Look, I, I just I don't I don't want to be one of these people whistling past the graveyard here. Um, I just happen to think that. And this is not my own gut telling me. I, I wish I wish it was uh, just a fleeting feeling that I had. Uh, but it's years of reporting on the ground uh, all over the country, and it's years of sort of uh, studying institutional decline in America. It's years of covering Congress and covering Washington and realizing that so many of the people we send, to the highest positions in this government are completely inadequate to the job. Uh, when you sort of step back and and look at where we are as a country right now, the combination of of rapidly diminishing confidence in our most essential institutions. I mean, you start with the ballot box because that's what we're discussing right now, and the numbers that, uh, in these public polls that we see about the people who have. Uh, no longer any any belief, any trust, any confidence in in our elections being run, you know, fairly and, and accurately and with integrity. Uh, that's terrifying, right? But but you you peel back so many layers beyond that, right? People have lost their confidence in the U.S. government, uh, local, state, and federal. People have lost their confidence in the media, and and in large part, I understand why. People have lost their confidence in law enforcement. People have lost their confidence in public education. People have lost their confidence in organized religion. People have lost their confidence in Major League Baseball. I mean, you just go on and on and on and on, right? Like we do not have any more these sort of societal pillars that can hold up the rest of the building when things start to when when when, when the uh, the floor starts to cave in a little bit, right? Like we don't have, I don't think anymore that sort of assurance to know that that we're going to be okay. Um, because, listen, the American people right now are in a pretty bad way. I, I think from, from my, you know, I've been in my truck driving all over the country the last 13 months. Uh, and, and what I've seen is not pretty. It, it's just not, I, I don't, I don't, I can't, bring myself to sugarcoat this, Charlie, like a lot of people are going to give you the old like, oh, but we're Americans, we still have more in common than we have that divides us. And I'm like, I'm not so sure that's true anymore. Like, I really don't know that that's true. Like, sure, we have things in common, like we breathe air, and we need food and shelter and, and love to survive. But like, we have that in common with Australians and Russians, too, right? Like we're human beings. But as Americans, uh, as as a people, what is it exactly that binds us together at this point? And this gets back to the conversation about institutions. Like we used to, in I think in large part, what, what at one point bound us together was a common belief and a common loyalty to these institutions of American life. And that is pretty much out the window at this point. Uh, you have... I think just this sort of crisis point approaching in America where you where you look around and you realize that the intersection of that diminished faith in our institutions, the sort of individual uh, basis on which people are no longer willing to sort of give the benefit of the doubt to people who disagree with them, uh, the misinformation that guides our biggest and most critical public policy debates in this country, right? The, the, the total lack of that shared baseline of information that we had as recently as like 20 years ago, right? Where people might argue and they might argue passionately about big issues, but their arguments were largely based on them having read the same articles and listened to the yeah. same news broadcasts, right? When you combine those things, Charlie, you're suddenly like 
you you you've you you've kind of created a powder keg, and I just I for one am not confident that we're going to keep that powder keg from exploding in a way that um, that is. I don't, it's kind of dark to think uh, about, but you talk to enough people, man, and, and, and you can start well, you to have. see how it happens. So you, you have, and you have spent the year, you know, trying to connect to ordinary Americans. And you talk about this in your article, you know, from Pennsylvania to New Mexico, from the back seats of Uber vehicles, you know, or, you know, touring shuttered restaurants. And this is, let me just read you something you wrote for the, for the benefit of the listeners, that basically your conclusion is that we have very little in common except our fear of each other. You wrote in, in, in Politico, I detected one common feeling that binds together this deeply fractured nation, fear, fear of violence, fear of their livelihood. It's fear of far left socialism or far right authoritarianism, fear that our best days are behind us, fear that America is no longer capable of conquering its great challenges. Above all, fear that we are too alienated, too angry with each other, too fundamentally misunderstood by the other half of society to ever truly heal. And that was before the election in November, before uh, a winner was declared. And um, what, what I sense is that everything you're describing there has gotten worse since November 3rd and the traject there's, there's nothing in the trajectory that that I can see that's going to change all of that. I mean, do, do you sense that that this post-election period has been even more toxic than the campaign or just a continuation or where do you come down? Yeah, I, look, I, I think I think in many ways, um, this has been kind of the worst case scenario that's played out over the last six weeks, Charlie. Um, okay. There was an opportunity here. And, and actually, let me even step back uh, a little bit more and say this. Um, you know, the post 9-11 era has been defined by this kind of inexorable descent into zero sum polarization in Washington and around the country. And the question that I've had for years has been, you know, Will there be some sort of galvanizing event, something that could do to the country, much like what 9-11 did, uh, sort of force everyone to reassess and and come together and respect our common nationality and our common humanity and sort of take a deep breath and step back from the abyss here, right? Like that's uh, because remember, like 9-11, you know, pre-9-11, like there were tense times in America, Bush v. Gore and the Clinton impeachment. Like this, that was a country very much sort of in, in deep internecine conflict. And we pulled back from it for a period, right? And there was a real moment of, of unity in this country that I have found myself wondering, you know, is it possible to, to recreate? Yeah. We've all um, that, yeah. Yeah, and, and so what's interesting is I think, you know, COVID-19 in many respects was a test of that. That that was a moment that we all could see it for, well, maybe not all of us, because there's some people who are, you know, just want to believe that it's not real and that it's just the flu and whatever else. But like the overwhelming majority of us can can understand that this was a, a real threat, that, that, that there was a... Uh, so, you know, big decisions that needed to be made and that lives were on the line and that this was going to be a test of our competency, not only as far as government is concerned, but as far as, uh, you know, I individuals and communities and, and uh, leaders in civic society, like how would they handle this, right? And if you want to look at it through the prism of that test, Charlie, the test of can we come together, then we failed utterly, right? We failed in in totally humiliating fashion. And so then you fast forward to the election and in the election, it, I think was a similar test, which was to say, you know, if this guy loses uh, after having spent the last, you know, four years telling everyone that we live in a banana republic that can't count its votes and that the system is being rigged against them and that um, Democrats are trying to cheat him out of office. Like if he loses, how will his voters respond, right? Like that's another huge stress test. And I think we failed that one miserably as well. And like, so, so what is it that would give us any confidence that, that, when, that when the next big stress test comes, whether that's a foreign conflict, whether it's some huge cyber attack, whether it's a, another infectious disease or pandemic invading our shores, what would give any of us any confidence that this country would pass that test when we've been failing these other ones so miserably? 
So, I mean, I, we've asked this question over and over and over again, but but focusing on on this sort of worst case scenario, to, to what extent right now is is Trump cause or symptom? I mean, how much of this is he driving? How much of this, and I'm talking about the, the denialism about the election, the fact that millions of people no longer think that we have a legitimate election. Millions of people, people believe things that are demonstrably untrue, like the voter fraud stories in Michigan, which you have documented in great detail. So how much of that is Trump? How much of that is, is, is Trump just being a system of something that is just so deeply and permanently dysfunctional? Well, let me be clear about this. And I wrote this in the like first paragraphs of my book a couple of years ago. I, I, I completely uh, subscribe to the theory that Trump was elected as a as a um, as a symptom, as a as a consequence of that zero sum polarization, as a consequence of uh, the sort of self selecting into informational echo chambers, as a consequence of the culture wars and the kind of social alienation uh, that that so many Americans felt and and the racial grievance and the resentment politics. Like, I think Trump was a consequence of that. Uh, That said, Charlie, I think that he has evolved over the last four years to become more and more a cause of what we're seeing now, if that makes sense. So in other words, in other words, I think that whereas he was once uh, almost entirely the the symptom. I think he's now much closer to the sickness. I think that he is uh, actively. I, I think he's playing an active and outsized role in the sort of continued unraveling and the accelerated unraveling of America's kind of social fabric. Like that. That to me is going to be the lasting legacy uh, of the Trump presidency. Is that. Uh, this was somebody who chose to divide America in ways that we've just, I don't think we've ever seen before, frankly. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and he recognizes that he's doing it. It's not, it's not unwitting. It's not unintentional. It's very much deliberate. And it's, and you know, it's getting worse every day. Like there's just no, there's no way to overstate how damaging the last six weeks have been to, to the American democratic process. And and we're going to be dealing with the implications of it, I think, for, for decades to come. No, I completely agree with that. Okay, so I, I'm always interested in, in alternative, you know, possible histories here. So let's imagine that on November, and this is completely speculative for both of us, you know, let's imagine that the morning after the, the election, or, or let's say a couple of days after the election, when it became clear that Trump had lost, and that Biden had won, what if, Mitch McConnell and all of the Republicans had immediately at that point done what every other political party has done, you know, with the exception of, say, 2000, and just simply said, "Okay, um, congratulations uh, to President-elect Biden. Um, No, we don't think that there was uh, there were irregularities enough to overturn this election. No, there was not systemic fraud. What if the entire Republican Party had cut Trump off at that point? Would that have made a difference? Over the last six weeks, or or would he have just steamrolled uh, steamrollered over them? I do think it would have made a difference, uh, and and I it's probably a difference at the margins, but that's still significant in my view, Charlie, because you know the difference between uh, seven out of ten Republican voters believing that the election was fraudulent versus six out of ten is is meaningful, right? And so if Trump was countered, uh, actively, consistently countered uh, in his messaging that the election was stolen and that it was fraudulent and that you can't trust this system. If he was countered day in and day out by local and state and federal officials on the Republican side, people who have ties to their communities, people who are are trusted and and viewed as authoritative uh, in their assertions, if they had been pushing back on that day in and day out, saying, "Listen, I respect the president. I I I am uh, honored to have served this, you know, belong, uh, alongside him. I uh, think that he's done great, good for the country. Yada yada yada. Right? Like they can they can build all of that into it, and then say, "But I disagree with him. He lost, right. and our elections officials." have verified that he lost and there is no sign whatsoever of widespread fraud. They, they're they're falling on their face in court. They're being laughed out of these courtrooms around the country. There's just, there's, there's no reason whatsoever 
to believe that uh, that he was cheated and we need to move on as a country. Had they done that, like, I don't know that you stop. Uh, I, I don't know that you just like completely close the floodgates off, but I do think that it matters. I think it would have mattered uh, and maybe more than just at the margins. I think that you have a lot of Republican voters out there who don't know what to believe. And when they when when all they hear is sort of a steady chorus from elected officials, from party leaders, from Fox News and Newsmax and OAN and Rush and everybody else, when all they hear is just this chorus from their side of the aisle saying that, yes, it was stolen and this is shady and suspicious and we need to look into it, then that's what they're going to believe. Right. Like. Right. So. So the, the lack of the lack of pushback there, I do think, did real damage. Oh, I think I think you're absolutely right there, too. I mean, you have trusted voices um, in, in every state could have pushed back on all this. And by the way, it, it, we ought to at least, at least acknowledge how truly extraordinary it was the the the, the role of the judiciary, including um, conservative judges, you know, that you had was at 88 now um, judges at every single level, whether you're talking about state courts, federal courts, federal appeals courts, the U.S. Supreme Court, shutting the door so definitively on on Trump. So you know, that bulwark of democracy worked. Also, uh, the number of uh, state officials, Republican officials in places like uh, um, one place like Georgia, obviously, Arizona, to a lesser extent, and, well, Pennsylvania and Michigan as well, um, all of whom did not go along, who you know, basically said, look, we're going to do our job, we're going to follow the law. Because in the back of my mind, though, I, I keep thinking of what a near run thing this was, that if this had come down to not six states, but one state, and if it was closer, and that you had a Trumpian Secretary of State or a Trumpian governor, what might have happened? What might have happened if this had come down to a handful of votes in, say, Florida with you know Ron DeSantis there? Um, th this, uh, this is the worst case scenario, but it could have been worse if it wasn't for the judges and for the local and state Republican officials. I think that's true. Um... I think that's absolutely right, and it's fair to it's fair to say, look, this was this was really bad and really ugly, really dark, uh, but it could have been worse. Could have been darker, <laughs> uh, and, and because if for no other reason, it's it's kind of like you know uh, war games, right? You, we, we should be, and we not like we in the media, not we as like conservatives or Democrats or liberals or Republicans or whatever. It's like we as Americans, we as citizens, we as people who are concerned about uh, extending this wonderful little run that America's had since 1776, like we should be thinking really critically about uh, how we clean this up and how we avoid uh, and even an even scarier uh, brush with uh, with the end next time around, because uh, as close as this felt, it wasn't actually as nearly as close as it could have been. You're absolutely right. So, you know, since we're we're on all of this, what do you where, where do you come down on this issue of of Trump forever versus uh, you know we're going to move past Trump? And and the reason I'm asking this is I I mean I, I think the default setting is that Trump continues to control the Republican Party. They're still going to be afraid of him, but. You know, as I mentioned earlier, there's a big gap between being president and not being president. And, and you know, a lot of Republicans have said, well, OK, yes, his personality is terrible. I, you know, the, the Trump's, you know, I mean, the 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 character is is awful. I try not to pay any attention to the tweets. I'm just looking at the policy. Well, he's about to become ex-president where he has nothing to give. This transactional president has nothing. There will be um, there will be no more judges, no more executive orders, no cuts in regulation, no tax cuts. There's never going to be a fucking wall, right? So you, you've had Republicans who've rationalized their support by insisting they ignore the bad stuff and they just focus on the accomplishments. But, but now all they're going to get is 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 Trump himself the sort of the boiled down essence so all there is of Trump is going to be the tweets it's going to be the rage it's going to be this defeated ex-president brooding in Mar-a-Lago um so I, I I'm a little bit torn on what is the what is the Trump ex-presidency look like are we ever going to be able to quit Trump I guess I'm asking you no, I don't think so. Um, I just I was afraid you were going to say that. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I hate to be the grim reaper here. I just I, I don't see 
I don't see any way that that Trump allows us to quit him. Uh, you know, we I don't think our <laughs> Charlie, the, the truth is, I don't think that we with our sort of, uh, you know, linear thinking minds can even begin to imagine what he might say and do over the next few years, right? Like, and I'm, and, and, and I'm kind of chuckling here, but it's, uh, but it's serious stuff, right? Like this no. is somebody who has had access to the most sensitive intelligence in the world. This is somebody who has uh, sort of unfettered personal access to just about any world leader that he wants, right? Like, what is to stop Donald Trump from essentially trying to run, you know, shadow diplomacy, if you want to call it diplomacy, uh, or, or kind of a shadow geopolitical game uh, uh, against Joe Biden, right? Like, what's to stop Trump from trying to play, actively play, as a private citizen, actively play world leaders against Biden? What's to stop Trump from hopping on a plane and going to North Korea well, okay. and hanging out with Kim Jong-un? Right? Well, all right. Well, I mean, what would stop him would be if they stopped taking his phone calls or realized that Joe Biden's the guy with the U.S. military and the nukes and um, Donald Trump's this, this, this guy with a Twitter account. Indeed. Indeed. I mean, but- What's to stop Trump from telling us that uh, that he's going over there and that he, you know, the same way that he was invited to throw the first pitch at Yankee Stadium? Oh, I was just invited by uh, by by NATO to come speak, right? Like, what? And I'm, I'm, I'm being serious you know, here, Charlie. Like, we just we don't know what this guy will do or say on any given day, and that's while he's the president. That's while he is in the Oval Office looking at a you know portrait of Abe Lincoln, like feeling some gravity, right? And people might laugh at that and say, oh yeah, well that's really done some good. Maybe it's done more good than you realize. Maybe what we've seen up until now is Trump light, right? Like there's nothing I'm just, you know, again, I I I have I have moved way beyond the business of underestimating this guy and what he's right. capable of. Well, you we've know all what I'm saying? Price. Well, yeah, I do know what you're saying. We've all paid a price for all of that, you know, and and that 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 constant refrain, well, you know, is this the bottom? Well, no, there's no bottom. <laughs> and and we and we haven't done it. I just do wonder that again, I I I think you're you're right, but on the other hand, there's this possibility that that the that the maximum Trump you know, show does become farce that that it really does become fat Elvis. That that the the uh, the Trump that was, uh, you know, that that uh, came down the escalator that was uh, boosted to the White House by Fox News is going to spend his time with with the total crackpots of OAN, or that he's going to go down the rabbit hole of you know even wilder conspiracy theories. Now I know, I know, I know. This is a guy that's already ridden ridden birtherism to the White House. So, you know, maybe he's figured out there's no downside to lying. There's no downside to any of this stuff. And he may be right. But, I, you know, I think we got to strap in for the worst former presidency ever. I mean, oh. I, I, you know, I mean, this is going to be I mean, he's going to be sitting down now. I just wonder what it's going to be like, you know, stripped of the trappings of the presidency, um, whether it's going to play in the same way. But but you're right. We don't know. You, we don't. I look, we don't know. Uh, and obviously, you have some Republicans. I mean, I think the truly fascinating part of this, Charlie, is you have some Republicans who have such a vested interest in the party turning the page on him. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, that that is in service of their own political ambitions, among other things, but also uh, sort of central to their own political ambitions is uh, harnessing the the intensity and the support and loyalty that so many of the president's supporters uh, feel for him and and they can't afford to be seen right giving this guy a kick in the ass on his way out the door right like they uh, or even once he's out the door they can't afford to be seen as sort of marginalizing him which is exactly why you know trump floating for the next two three four years another run for the presidency is sort of a a Machiavellian master stroke on his part, because even if he has zero interest in ever running for office again, he knows that in many ways he keeps these guys paralyzed, that they, they, they can't dare to break from him. They can't dare 
to, to criticize him because in criticizing him, they are really criticizing many of his own, you know, his own most loyal followers. And that's, that's a line that these guys haven't been willing to cross. Okay. So back to where we started. So where does Mitch McConnell fit into all of this? I mean, he basically, he, uh, he had to, uh, he enraged Trump world by acknowledging the results of the election. He's moving on. What, what game does he play here? I mean, he's, he, he now is a central player um, in, in both the future of the Republican Party and, and the success of the Biden administration. So, I mean, Mitch McConnell becomes a really fascinating figure in American politics right now, doesn't he? He does, uh, although I would, I, would, I would put McConnell in a very different category from, you know, the Ted Cruz's and the Josh oh, sure. Hawley's and the Tom yeah. Cotton's and the Nikki Haley's uh, for I'm a few reasons. Yeah. You know, n- number one, um, McConnell is uh, worried about the party more than he's worried about sort of his own specific ambitions. And, um, you know, that's because he's already majority leader. He doesn't have another office in mind. And he just won another six year Senate term, which will probably be his last because he'll be he's 78 right now. He's about to turn 79, I think. So, um, he, you know, he'll be 85 at the end of th- his next term. If 85 is the long. new 55. Yeah, right. Well, in the U.S. Senate. It is. <laughs> yeah, right. So but I, so so all of that's to say, Charlie, that, look, I mean, speaking of Machiavellian, like nobody's more Machiavellian than, than Mitch McConnell. But that said, I don't know that McConnell uh, feels any of that same pressure or, or certainly doesn't feel nearly as much of that same pressure to sort of appease the MAGA coalition as the rest of these, you know, aspiring leaders of the free world do. I think McConnell uh, is, you know, he wants to keep the Republican base happy. Don't get me wrong. He'll, he'll sort of, you know, pull the, pull the rabbits from his hat to do that. But I also think McConnell is sort of invested in playing a longer game, making sure that Republicans can win back the White House in 2024, uh, that they can win back control of Congress in 2022 more immediately. And I think in service of that, McConnell isn't going to get dragged along on this sort of post-presidential, you know, uh, float parade of the, you know, the the Seb Gorkas and uh, and, uh, Amarosas and, and Corey Lewandowski's sort of marching on Washington figuratively and literally trying to like, trying to keep alive the mystique of the Trump years. Like I think McConnell, uh, if for no other reason than his interest in helping the Republican party win elections, uh, he understands that that stuff's just not helpful. So I think he'll be more forceful, uh, more deliberate in, in turning that page than a lot of these other folks will. Yeah, uh, it's so. not to say that he's going to go stick a finger in the eye of, of, of Trump voters. I just think he has a way uh, that that he'll do it, uh, that he can sort of, you know, that he can sort of thread that needle in a way that most other folks won't even try. Okay. And, and the other side of that is, of course, the, this debate about whether or not Joe Biden is just incredibly naive to think that he can cut deals with Republicans. Uh, you're seeing a lot of pushback on both the right and the left about all of that. So what do you think? What are the prospects that, let's assume for the sake of this discussion, um, that the Republicans win in Georgia, which I'm going to assume at this point, because that's what happens generally in these off-year elections. You can disagree with me there. So that uh, Mitch McConnell stays in control of the Senate. So what are the prospects? What What is Joe Biden going to be able to get through Mitch McConnell's Senate? So I, I think there are two ways of looking at this, Charlie. I, th- I think there's this sort of, there's the uh, kind of politically emotional way of looking at this, which is like, oh, have, have you forgotten what these guys did to Obama? Have right. you, you know, ha- have you no understanding of Mitch McConnell and his kind of ruthless, bloodthirsty approach to politics and uh, the obstructionist ways of the Republican Party? Uh, look, uh, yes, all of that can be observed. It can be debated. It can be understood. Uh, I'm not oblivious to those realities. I've written about them more than just about anybody in American life. Uh, That having been said, you know, you can also observe sort of a parallel reality, which is that Democrats are going to hold their slimmest Senate majority, uh, excuse me, their slimmest House majority in, I think, like 75 years. Uh, They're going to either have the thinnest possible Senate majority, or they're going to be barely in the Senate minority. 
Uh, all of which is to say that Joe Biden will enter office with, I think, really no choice but to act overtly and explicitly bipartisan with his approach to just about any problem that they're trying to solve. This is not Obama 09 coming into office with damn near Democratic supermajorities in both chambers, right? Where where the only calculus you were doing as far as, you know, vote whipping was, okay, you know, we can only afford to lose, you know, 30 House Democrats, right? Like, you know, this is just a fundamentally different equation. And I think Joe Biden is a fundamentally different politician than Barack Obama is. I, I can't emphasize this enough. I said this the other day uh, on MSNBC, Charlie. I did this interview with Biden uh, pretty pretty shortly after he'd left office as vice president and he was back to being a private citizen. And we were having this long conversation about sort of institutional distrust and, and Washington's dysfunction. And he told me this story about how um, during one of his final years uh, as vice president, uh, he'd gone up to Capitol Hill and he wanted to go meet with some senators, some of his buddies on the Senate side to talk about some negotiation. And he he said to them, he said, hey, can you can you sneak me into the senators only dining room? And they said, no, it, it's not there anymore. And he said, what do you mean it's not there? They said, it's not there. Now, Biden went on to explain to me that, you know, for decades, he had lunch almost every day in this tiny little like cubby hole in the wall, senators only dining room. Now there's a much bigger Senate dining room where you can bring staff and lobbyists and family members. But but this little senators only dining area, there was just a little buffet table and a couple of uh, uh, round tables and it was senators only and they would spend almost every weekday having lunch together in there, Democrats and Republicans, and they would talk about their life and sports and family and, and everything else, and they would become friends. And, and to Biden's mind, that was sort of a crucial part of governing, that, that these guys built real relationships that allowed them to sort of get past any contempt or distrust for one another that, that was so disruptive to the political process. So to Biden, when he went up to Capitol Hill and when he found out that that little annex had been uh, that had been taken down because nobody was using it anymore, he got really emotional telling me this story. And, and to him, that was sort of a symbolic uh, blow to Washington's like bipartisan functionality. It, it, he took it really hard. And I, I, sh I say that story, Charlie, I share that to say that whatever you think of Biden uh, personally or politically, like this is somebody at his core who is an institutionalist who who believes that like Washington used to function better when people weren't pissed off at each other all the time. And, and so I do believe that that is a real goal of his is to try and lower the temperature and 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 try to restore some normalcy to the process in Washington. And I think in many ways he is aided in that pursuit by these threadbare numbers that the, these tiny majorities that either he's going to have or that the Republicans are going to have, like there's just no room to maneuver any other way than to get a big bipartisan coalition of people together. So whether that's on infrastructure, whether that's on lowering health care costs, whether it's on border security, climate stuff, you name it, there's not going to be, I think, uh, any sort of I shouldn't say any, but I just don't think we're we're in for two years of like nonstop bitter party line fighting yeah. because because it just it wouldn't advance anything. And Biden knows that he can't do it. He can't do it. Tim Alberta, thank you so much for joining us. Tim Alberta, of course, is the chief political correspondent for Political Magazine. It is always great to talk with you, Tim. Pleasure, Charlie. Thanks for having me, man. Merry Christmas and happy holidays to you and all your listeners. As, and you uh, as, as well. And thank you for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow and we'll do this all over again.